opportunity for all. In line with this, this year's lecture is themed Radio Rulers and the Ruled in the Fourth Republic, 24 years of an evolving relationship in a democracy. Before we kick start what promises to be an exciting two hours, do let me recognize our sponsors. Of course, Stan Big Bank is one of them, KPMG, Unique Image Limited, and City FM. We're extremely grateful uh, for your sponsorship and collaboration with CDD Ghana. Of course, we also do know that this program has been put together in compliance with all COVID-19 safety protocols and is live on CDD's Facebook page as well as City FM's Facebook page. We're also live on City 97.3 FM. Now, let's look at the hashtags we should be using. I'm sure many of you will be tweeting throughout uh, this program. Hashtag Krontini Akwamu. You can also use hashtag Kronti2020 and hashtag Avle Speaks. Without much ado, let me introduce the chairperson, or rather, the executive director for CDD Ghana, Professor H. Chrissy Prempe, so that he can introduce the chairperson uh, for this evening's program. A round of applause for him, please. Friends, uh, partners in civil society, the media, government, and the business and development communities. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the board, management, and staff of the Ghana Center for Democratic Development to this, the 16th annual Krontini Akwamu Lecture. The Krontini Akwamu Lectures, uh, the Krontini Akwamu Lecture is CDD Ghana's flagship public lecture on democracy and governance. Launched in March 2005, the lecture is delivered annually by a local or international public figure, scholar, or activist whose career or work reflects an enduring engagement with and commitment to democracy, good governance, and inclusive development. These being the three interrelated ideals that define CDD Ghana's mission. Through the Krontini Akamu Lectures, CDD Ghana aims to elevate and invigorate the public conversation, provoke critical thought and reflection, and inspire fresh insights and perspectives on the experience, practice, and prospects of democracy, governance, and development in Ghana and Africa. Past Krontini Akamu speakers include Nobel Peace Prize laureate, and former UN Secretary General, the late Mr. Kofi Annan, Dr. K.Y. Amwakun, former Ghanaian head of the Economic Commission for Africa and founder president of the Center, Africa Center for Economic Transpo Transformation, veteran Ghanaian political commentator and journalist, Mr. Abdul Malik Kokubakun, Dr. Jendai Fraser, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, the late Right Honorable Peter Alajete, former Speaker of Parliament, Democracy Scholar Professor Larry Diamond of Stanford University, B.C. Adeleye Fayemi, former Executive Director of African Women Development Fund, the late Ghanaian jurist, Justice VC RAC Krab, former chair of the Ghana Electro Electoral Commission, Dr. Kwejo Afarijan, and Ghanaian political scientist and co-founder and CEO of Afrobarometer, and co-founder and past executive director of CDD Ghana, Professor E. Jimabwedi. Professor Emeritus Techua Menu delivered the 15th annual Krontini Akwamu Lecture last year. These lectures are named Krunti Ni Akwamu after the Akan Edinkra motif that represents mutually dependent and complementary divisions of the Akan state, two halves of the state that must both work together and check each other for the effective governance of the community. It symbolizes traditional democracy 
with its emphasis on participatory decision making and governing based on consultation and participation. With this year's Krontini Akwamu lecture, we aim to reflect and take stock of the journey we have traveled as a democracy in the 25 years since Tarzan's Radio Eye took to the airwaves on November 1994, announcing its and welcome arrival with a popular tune, Ain't No Stopping Us Now, and doing so deliberately without a license, but asserting a then untested right under the 1992 Constitution to establish and operate a private radio in open defiance of then existing law and practice that had restricted access to the airwaves to the state broadcaster the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation. That historic act of civic rebellion set in motion a series of events and developments that would lead eventually to the official dismantling of the state's monopoly of broadcast radio and with it the official birth of private radio and independent broadcast journalism in Ghana. We are privileged and delighted to have as our speaker for this, the 16th annual Continua Kwamu Lecture, an important and influential voice and leader in our contemporary public square, a man whose current career in radio, in private radio and broadcast journalism, comes a generation after Radio I, yet whose career is very much a part of the legacy of the pioneering act of creative disruption undertaken 25 years ago by Tarzan and his compatriots. To chair this evening's lecture, as well as introduce our speaker, is another name and voice with a diverse and rich career and experience in the post-radio eye Ghanaian broadcast media space. A media and communication professional with 23 years of industry experience, Ms. Emma Morrison was until June 2020, the general manager for the Joy Cluster at the Multimedia Group, with responsibility for strategic direction of the Joy Brands. Before then, she was the group head of business programming, also at Multimedia, and also previously managed the 24-hour news and current affairs TV channel, Joy News, for the multimedia group, in which capacity she handled business planning, strategic development, and also spearheaded several specialized projects funded by external partners and donors. Before her career with multimedia, Ms. Morrison worked in various capacities at TV3 Network Limited for 16 years, starting out as a junior reporter and anchor becoming the manager for the Foreign International Affairs Desk and then general manager of the news and sports, of news, for news and sports at TV3 Network Limited. Ms. Morrison also has extensive experience working with and assisting civil society organizations to develop and enhance the content, impact, and outcomes of their advocacy and outreach. Among organizations she's worked with in this regard, in this regard are IDEC, Star Ghana, GOGIC, which is the Ghana Oil and Gas for Inclusive Development, Inclusive Growth Program, the African Center for Economic Transformation, ASET, as well as agencies like the World Bank. Ms. Morrison has a master's degree in international communications from the University of Leeds, UK, and completed various executive training programs in leadership, management, training and development, and branding, at a number of institutions, including the Columbia University Graduate School, Business School in New York, and the Ghana, the China Europe International Business School. Emma is currently participating in the one year Future Female program run by the Ghana Employers Association. We are honored to have Ms. Emma Morrison to chair this evening's lecture. Would you please join me 
with a round of applause to invite our chairperson for this evening's lecture to the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much. You said so much, and I was just wondering, because I always feel that there's more I should be doing that I haven't done. So definitely, I'll be doing more to help develop media and society. Thank you so much, Prof. So I'm happy to be here today to chair this special lecture. And um, I just want to borrow a quote from Jim Morrison, who was an American singer. I like to think of him as my long lost relative, you know, because who doesn't want to be associated with a very successful artistic person? So in effect, what he actually says is, Whoever controls the media controls the mind. So that is his quote. And um, so in effect, what this means is the media is impactful and a reflection of society. This Morrison would add that whoever controls the media controls the narrative and the mind of a nation. It is for this reason that dictators detest liberalization of the media, and we know that. They want to control information flow. It is for this same reason powerful people, and actually including politicians, would love to own media. It is for the same reason cool makers in the past would capture the national broadcaster, the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation, to announce the coup, and also use the national broadcaster for other major public announcements. The power of radio is not a myth at all. Radio is the most powerful medium of mass communication. For many Ghanaians, radio is the most dominant source of information. Recent Afrobarometer surveys confirm this. As we reflect on the power of radio and its impact in shaping viewpoints and national conversations, I'm reminded of something I studied many years ago. Yeah, and I always remember this. The medium is the message. This is the phrase coined by Canadian communication theorist, Marshall McLaren, and introduced in his 1964 book, Understanding Media, The Extensions of Man, McLuhan proposes that a communication medium itself is not the messages it carries. Should be, sorry. So he's saying that not the message it carries, but it should be the primary focus of study. He had probably wanted people to understand that the form of media takes actually embeds itself in the message and influences how that message is perceived. Of course, things have changed very much since Lakmahan's proposition in 1964. That's years and years ago. We are all aware that the internet is the future and that social media has become a very significant source of information. Nonetheless, we all go back to radio, the traditional media, to confirm the authenticity or otherwise of news. What then is the responsibility of the media in a democratic dispensation like ours? And of course, Article 162, Clause 5 of the 1992 Constitution tells us what the responsibility of the media ought to be. It says, all agencies of the mass media shall at all times be free to uphold the principles, provisions, and objectives of this constitution and shall uphold the responsibility and accountability of the government to the people of Ghana. That is so significant. 
With this responsibility clearly defined by the Constitution, perhaps we should ask ourselves a few questions in trying to understand whether or not the media is performing its responsibility. Have we been able to harness the power of the media to get our governance right? When governments make promises, is the media able to hold them to account? How many times do we verify government claims? Do journalists engage citizens effectively to share their views on their most pressing needs that warrant the attention of government? Or do we rather give the microphone to the people who can give very exciting sound bites or people who are notorious? Unfortunately, we often reduce everything to a partisan discussion. Radio discussions seem to be embroiled in NDC says this, and so NPP, what do you have to say? And vice versa. Why should conflicting views and controversy always dominate national content? The media has allowed so much spin on key national issues that drown out the voice of reason that should prevail in shaping major public policy decisions. Should it be about sensationalization or for ratings? Yes, there are those who would say that's what excites audiences, but should that be the focus? Increasingly, people are demanding more relevant content, but the picture of the performance of the media in Ghana is not all gloomy. We have made significant strides. Investigative journalists like Manas Azuri have consistently put the spotlight on major corruption scandals and by so doing caused significant executive action in terms of public accountability. His recent investigation into dealings of the CEO of the Public Procurement Authority, PPA, led to further investigations by the Commission on the Human Rights for Administrative Justice, SHRAJ, and the subsequent sacking of the CEO in question by the President. We await the findings of the Special Prosecutor on this matter. Also recently, Cocoa Board has reviewed the implementation of the COCO Sustainability Program to prevent abuse of the scheme. This follows investigations by Joy News, revealing how one could rent a COCO certificate, renting a certificate, for as high as one million cities. It has not always been about fraud and scandal. Stories done by the media have led to construction of hospitals, improvement in prison conditions, and release of people on remand for years. Victims of police and military brutalities have received some form of justice due to the media. Stories have coerced governments to construct roads. Stories have forced governments to build hospitals and schools. There are many journalists that have changed the course of this country because of their desire to tell the right story. And I salute them all. But why do we tell these stories? I often ask my teams, why are you doing this story? What about the Ejapame knows royalty story. Did the media tell it right? Media should aim to arm citizens with the right and credible information so they can be well informed and also hold duty bearers accountable and demand their rights as citizens. This is a partnership we should have with the public to effectively push for accountability, development, and social justice. However, the media must be keenly aware of the magnitude of their responsibility and the power they wield. Ownership and control of media can destroy societies and even lead to uninformed and ill-informed public. Business and commercial interests can kill stories and people do not get to know what goes on around them in order to make informed choices. It's a triangle and the media is in the middle. So how do we deliver the, co the country we want? Let's reflect on this as we eagerly wait to hear from our speaker tonight who will put forth arguments 
on radio, rulers, and the ruled in the Fourth Republic. 25 years of an evolving relationship in a democracy. I'm looking forward to that, and I'm sure you are too. So let's have a good evening. Thank you very much. I think we can do better than that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Morrison, for uh, dropping those nuggets of wisdom. We're very excited to hear what Mr. Avle has to say. As we continue to acknowledge more board members for CDD Ghana, uh, Mr. James Straha is with us. So if you could be upstanding so that we could acknowledge your presence. There he is. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Now, as mentioned, this program is uh, brought to us of course by CDD Ghana, but we also do have some very special sponsors and they are with us today. And so let me start by inviting the representatives from Stambik Ghana to give us um, their comments and remarks this evening. Thank you very much. Hello rather quiet place. Is it because we're going to talk about 25 years of radio? <laughs> Madam Chairperson, I see a number of um, very familiar faces I haven't sent us here, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, Auntie Audrey, I see you. Uncle Kweku, I see you, and I see a lot more people. I bring you greetings from Madam Chairperson, with your kind permission, I'll drop this. I bring you greetings from Stambik Bank, Ghana. And we are here today primarily because we are part of a group that believes strongly and deeply in Africa. We say Africa is our home. We've said it consistently. And by extension, Ghana is our dwelling place. Now, what that means is that we are Ghanaian to the core. We are human at the heart, and we are driven to succeed. And for that to happen, our country needs to flourish. We are in a space where we've dealt with the polarity choice for a very long time. And I'm also equally intrigued to hear what Bernard is going to talk to us about today. Because part of the challenge and I believe, and my generation who saw radio, Beth, and who back in the day would skip lectures for a whole day, just to listen to FM, because FM was so new. And I'm not even talking about the latter radio. I'm talking of the original Joy FM, the first time it came. It was so exciting. And there was so much promise inherent in that fledging new piece of creation we saw in this country. Part of the belief was that we're going to have dreams realized for this country. We're going to see democracy. Democracy was going to come with development. Development was going to come with prosperity. And we have a country where there was a lot of hope, belief, confidence, and where the youth would dream about tomorrow, knowing that they had clear paths to change the quality of their lives and the quality of their communities and the quality of our country. 25 years on, it's become a polarity choice. It's nearly as if it's either democracy or development. It's nearly as if it's either the rule of law or some very chaotic situations as we've had recently in other countries. But our circumstances, the reason why Standard Bank has been around in Africa for 155, 158 years is that we understand the continent and we love the continent and we believe in the continent. Our circumstances in Ghana call for us not to take a binary choice, but to take the choices that would take care of our children, that will give us hope, that will give us a clear path to success, to prosperity, and to live in the life that we believe the natural resources of this country demands of us. And it's a collective responsibility of all of us, including those of us in corporate Ghana, those of us in this room, CSOs, the political leadership, and indeed the entire leadership class, and the middle class, and the rest of the country, together. We believe there is a deep future for Ghana. And we are looking forward to that. Bernard, our ears are tingling with expectation. Good evening. 
Thank you very much. Our other sponsors are KPMG and Unique Image as well. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Samuel Atamensa, Managing Director, City FM and City TV. Can we see you, sir? He's at the back. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. Don't forget that we are live on City 97.3 FM. We're also live on CDD Ghana's Facebook page as well as City FM social media pages. The hashtag to use, hashtag Avlis Speaks, hashtag Kronti2020, and hashtag Kronti Nyakwamu. And uh, on that note, um, Madam Chair, I have to invite you back so that we can introduce the speaker, or rather you can introduce the speaker for this evening's program. If we can welcome back our chairperson for this event. Thank you. So, the 16th edition, and I'm happy to introduce Bernardino Avle. He's a general manager of CTFM and CTTV. He has an economics degree from the University of Ghana, first class honors, and an MBA from Warwick University, UK, Chevening Scholar, class of 2008-2009. He hosts the leading English language talk show on Ra Ghana Radio, the City Breakfast Show, and is also the host of Current Affairs Program, The Point of View on City TV. Bernard, as he's usually called, has done pioneering work in using commercial radio and TV platforms to champion good governance and social accountability. The City Breakfast Show was adjudged the interactive show of the year at the BBC's Africa Radio Awards in 2007, in Nairobi, Kenya, and Radio Program of the Year 2013, 2015, and 2016 by the Chartered Institute of Marketing Ghana, CIMG, the show has also been adjudged the best morning show English for four consecutive years, 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019 by the Ghana Journalists Association, GJA. Bernard is an Alua Fellow, an Edward R. Murray Fellow of Journalism, and was adjudged the Ghana Journalists Association, GJA, Journalist of the Year in 2018. So I'm really looking forward to this, Bernard, and I believe he has a lot to say. So let's listen to him. Thank you very much, Emma. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, listeners. Good evening, viewers. I have divided attention. My, I'm, I'm thinking about the U.S. election. <laughs> because before I finished the speech, they said Trump was closing the gap. And the thing was disturbing me. <laughs> so feel free to stop me at any point you hear that somebody has won. Because that is the real news. But thank you, Madam Chair Emma Morrison, for those kind words. And for being such a great example of media excellence. This will be the first Continue Akwemu delivered in a mask. Do you want that record or should I remove the mask? <laughs> I can remove it, okay. <laughs> that would be serious. Thank you. So maybe you want to give me a bit of space so that if I have COVID, you won't get it. <laughs> okay. I wish to thank CDD, the board, chair, members, executive director, Professor HKP, Audrey. Uh, I want to commend CDD for your seamless transition. It's a great source of pride to us, particularly in the media and civil society, because you've managed affairs so ably, you are proof that you can practice what you preach. From Professor Jima Buidi to yourself, it's been seamless. So let's put our hands together for CDD. Please, there'll be a lot of clapping, so you, you better get used to it. Please, please do a better one, I beg you. There's refreshment at the end, so if you want it. I want to thank the chairman of City FM, Nika Matefiu, we call him Papa Nick, for your vision, because that's why I'm here today. And to Samuel Atamensa, we call him Samens. We are living in extraordinary times, 
<clears throat> Some say times like this occur once in a century. For example, two days ago, on US election day, during an interview with US Ambassador Sullivan, I found myself asking questions that would typically be asked of an ambassador of a developing country by a Western journalist. It's not often that you get to ask an American ambassador, how long will it take to know the result of the election? Will the sitting president accept the outcome? Will you still have a job if the sitting president loses? Until recently, these situations were almost unfathomable to contemplate about America's democracy. But here we are. These are strange times. I also noticed that in line with the strangeness of the times and the novelty of the occasion, the continued Aquemu lectures have always been held in March. This appears to be the first time we're having it in December, a situation I suspect COVID-19 has something to do with. And I was really wondering which of my sins God wanted to punish me for by giving CDD the idea that I should deliver a lecture in this highly polarized political environment exactly one month to our own crucial elections. To make matters worse, a careful look at the previous speakers for this lecture convinces me that we are really in extraordinary times. It's not often that an under 40 journalist gets to appear on a platform graced by His Excellency Kofi Annan, the Right Honorable Peter Lajete, Dr. Kojwa Farijan, the Venerable Justice V.C. R.A.C. Krab, Dr. K.Y. Amwaku, Professor Techiwa Menu, Professor Naomi Chazan, Dr. Jendai Fraser, and of course, Professor Jima Bwedi himself. Last week, my colleague Manasse Azure Awuni delivered the Kwekju Banredu annual lectures. And here I am today. It appears a new wind of change is blowing in the Ghanaian media space, and young voices are being heard. Long may it continue. I'm aware of this risk, though, that if I flank it, this will be the last time somebody like me comes here. <laughs> so please pray for me. Now, although this may seem like just a coincidence, I'm sure there's a divine hand at play. Because today, November 5, 2020, is exactly 16 years since CTFM started operations in Ghana. I've been working at CTFM since it was founded. CDD did not know that today was our anniversary when they chose the date. Kojo is my witness. And when he told me it was November 5, it didn't click at the time. I only got the click last week. Also, our 16th anniversary coincides with the 16th edition. Something is surely at work. The lines are falling onto me in pleasant places. Now, let me say that I accepted this topic with a bit of trepidation. Radio, rulers, and the rule in the Fourth Republic. I thought it was too long and unnecessary alliteration. In our line of work as journalists, words are everything. When a reporter refers to a political party being voted into power, we would often correct them and say, say they were voted into office since that agrees with our view of what they come to do. The word rulers and the ruled are a bit like power. The connotations are not democratic enough for me. Kings rule, presidents govern. I was therefore quite surprised that Kojo, of all people, Kojo Asante, agreed to go with this sacrilegious ruling rule motif. Maybe it's a sign of the times. But on a more serious note, beyond the convenience of alliteration, these words were intentionally chosen to demonstrate perhaps the nature of the relationship between Ghanaians and their political leaders. It's become one in which even though citizens can often say whatever they want, the government inevitably does what it pleases. Okay. Professor Kwam Kakeri, in his 14th Continuum Kwemu lecture, eloquently captured this, the paradox of voice without accountability. The word republic was also some way for me. It was made popular by Plato, in a seminal work, The Republic. Now, unlike Plato's Republic, this Republic I'm talking about is neither ideal nor is it ruled by philosopher kings. It was Plato who once famously or infamously said, democracy passes into despotism. Where he's sitting here today, I'm not sure he would be too impressed by my approach and emphasis. 
Because while Plato had no hope for popular democracy, after what he did to Socrates, his mentor, I think there is still a lot of hope for popular multi-party democracy with the universal adult suffrage as a viable system of governance. Plato's Republic was an utopia, or was a utopia, ruled by philosopher kings. He nicknamed them navigators. Our republic is less than ideal and is governed by sailors. Well, the sailors are politicians, according to Plato. Let's talk about Ghana's media and democracy. Ghana's recent history as a nation state has seen us vacillate between democratic governance and military rule. The Fourth Republic in its 27th year has been the most successful period of uninterrupted democratic governance. This feat has placed us ahead of our contemporaries with a proud record of three peaceful political transitions, a record not to be toyed with. Many factors have contributed to this, including inevitably the role of the media. The 1992 Constitution guarantees our place, and as Madam Chair quoted, permit me to requote, Article 1625 says, all agencies of the mass media shall at all times be free to uphold the principles provisions and objectives of this constitution and shall uphold the responsibility and accountability of the government to the people. This clearly spells out the imperative of media freedom needed to fuel a democracy in keeping governments responsible and accountable to the people. Beyond the imperative of freedom, the provision also implies a three-way relationship, government, media, citizens. My aim tonight is to share my observations about how our fourth Republican democracy has been shaped by the media with an understandably biased emphasis on radio, in particular private radio. Radio in Ghana has been with us since the mid-1930s. The ZOY, named after the sign ZD4AA, in the 30s relayed BBC overseas programming to the then Gold Coast. Then GBC began to do local programs. We were ushered into a period of coups, which ended with the December 31 coup by Rawlings. As earlier mentioned, the media played an important role in these periods, breaking the culture of silence with the likes of the Free Press, the Ghanaian Chronicle, and the Guide being mentioned as media entities that help open up the space. Names like Professor P. A. V. Ansa, Cabral Ble Amihir, Nana Kofi Kumsen, Gifti Afenyidazi, and Kweku Sechiado, to name a few, will be forever remembered in this regard. In 1995, the Ghana Frequency Registration and Control Board opened application licenses to operate broadcast services independent of GBC. The first frequencies were assigned in July 1995. They were issued two years into our fourth Republican journey, a development that was triggered, as said by Professor HKP, by Charles Recubrobe's daring attempt to test the law. This, by the way, earned him the moniker Tarzan, because according to Totobi Kwachi, he was jumping <laughs> ahead of time and swinging without control. The operations of the likes of Joy FM, Radio Gold, Vibe FM, Otec FM, and later on Peace FM coincided with the opening up of the political space. Okay. Now, my personal love affair with radio started whilst I was in secondary school. Right. Listening to Radio Universe do a program called Legon Decides. This is campus nukes elections. I remember in 97, 98, a hotly contested race between Paul Adomotri of Commonwealth Hall and Emmanuel A.J. Thompson of Ligon Hall for the position of Nukes president. I still remember the reporter, Nat Kwabna Adisi, AKA Bolare, filing a report to summarize the election. And this was how it ended. This year, Ligon Hall have gone for their own and voted for Thompson. Paula Domotri, who was then news anchor of TV3, had been undone by his misunderstood claim 
that he was not an ordinary student. <laughs> Much as Paul tried to explain his comment to mean that he was better placed by his exposure to national leaders to address students' concerns, Domi, as Domsin was called, his camp had a field day with songs and chants that they were more brothers who felt the ordinary student's pain. Needless to say, Paul lost Domi one. Listening to that post-election discussion on Radio Universe as a secondary school student was my first lesson in the concepts that would define my work. Live on-field election reporting, the power of the question, the nuances of scorekeeping, the complexities of gatekeeping, agenda setting, and the power the media has to sometimes determine election outcomes, as we are seeing somewhere this week. As an aside, Paul, by the way, is still in the media. He left politics to do media. He's host of Good Evening Ghana. Ajay Domsin became a DC under the Kufa administration. He's now an MPP candidate for Asikumat or Dobrin Brakwa. And guess what? Bolare is now the CEO of the EIB group. Some habits die hard. The growing importance of radio in the 90s was evidenced by the caliber of journalists it attracted. Show hosts like Kwesi Pratt on Point Blank on Vibe FM. Kweku Baku, Hotline, Groove FM, Ben Epsons, Epsons File, Radio Gold, evidence that newspaper journalists saw the medium radio as complementary to their work. They were complemented by the PLS Komla Dumo on the Super Morning Show on Joy FM, which had Kweku Sechado's front page as a Friday feature. There was KSM's fiery talk shop on Vibe FM, and Kwame Sefakai's Kanewu segment on Radio Gold on Wednesdays, my favorite. There was also Mami Dokunus Odoni Asumjwe, which captured the imagination of a different class of listeners, and Efia Kunedus Uhauni Seng on Peace FM. These radio programs did a lot to entrench the democratic culture by keeping listeners well informed and providing a platform for healthy political debate and discourse. Peace FM, in particular, was crucial in bringing along the masses as its use of the tree language suddenly opened the floodgates for popular participation in political discourse at the national level. In fact, some people think the way Ghanaians define democracy in tree, kebi mamin kebi, to wait, speak and let me speak, has something to do with the influence of local language stations like Peace FM, in particular Adom FM and later on Happy FM. Having been lucky to have lived through these 27 years as a listener, a trainee, a journalist, and now a manager, I will now proceed to share my observations about the nuances in the relationship between radio, citizens, and government. I'll make it simple for you. I've identified three paradoxes. I'll discuss them briefly. Then I'll talk about three emerging trends, and I'll end with three recommendations. By the time I finish, we'll know who has won the US election. Paradox one, less profit, yet more commercial operators. I've always known Ghana's media environment as being highly saturated by comparing our numbers with those of other African countries. But a closer look at the numbers revealed something that shocked me. I've put the chart on the screen. Ghana's 30 million people have over five. Even Nigeria, with a population of 200 million, has less than 400. Calculating what I've put in the fourth column, my own term I call radio saturation or audience size per station, the average commercial radio station in Ghana will have only 52,000 people as its maximum audience. If you divide.
What is driving the increase in number of radio stations is the commercial, the yellow line. This yellow line, this is the commercial people. These guys are community, these guys are Being the general manager of one of the leanest media businesses in this country, I'm convinced that the increase in number of radio stations steadily has nothing to do with commercial viability or profitability. People are acquiring licenses either due to ignorance of how the medium actually works or a quest to reap benefits beyond money. We'll explore that later. The second paradox is the paradox of more licenses and less geographical coverage. Ghana's radio market is puzzling. Let me show you the number of new licenses awarded since records started in 1995. The blue line at the bottom is the number of new licenses awarded every year. The orange line at the top of the graph is the total number of radio stations in operation. Since 1995, over 500 licenses have been given. Four years stand out as having the highest number of licenses a year, looking at the blue chart. This is the net or number of licenses given every year. 69, 65, 55, 44. What you would not notice because the graph is far is that there is a, co a, a, a coincidence of high number of radio licenses and election years. Look at 2016, 69 licenses. 2012, 55. 2020, this is second quarter. It's already how much? 65. So I'm sure by the time election finish, we are around 70. Now, in percentage terms, the number of stations has doubled every decade. The whole of 90s, 95 to 2000, we have 65 new licenses in total. Between 2000 and 2010, we had 139 stations added. This decade has had 365. If the rate of growth of licenses continues, by 2030, we would have 1,000 radio stations in this country. Now, the irony is that at the same time, the regulator is reducing the extent of geographical coverage of the radio stations. In 2015, the NCA announced that it was reducing our coverage as commercial entities from 100 kilometer radius to 45, a decision Giba vehemently opposed. Because these radio licenses are not given free of charge, it will seem as if the award of licenses has become a cash cow for the NCA without due consideration for the viability of these businesses. There also seems to be political pressure for incumbent governments to award as many new licenses as possible, potentially as a way of mobilizing support or expanding their footprint of, quote, friendly radio stations. In this sense, what is our livelihood has become somebody's political football. The effects of this policy on viability of the media is already showing. Many private radio stations are not doing well. Journalists are poorly paid. They are ill-equipped to do their work professionally. Now, poor pay is never a justification for accepting bribes. But media owners have to do more to reduce the temptation their reporters face. Another noteworthy and troubling development we see is the drop in the blue line in 2017. Every year we've had a positive addition to radio stations, but in 2017 it was minus 10. The NCA said some stations failed to renew their authorization, some for 16 years. And while I don't condone radio stations breaking the law, 34 radio stations being shut down is not a good sign. The law of shutting down radio stations ought to be a last resort, and it sends wrong signals about the state's intentions concerning media freedom. 
This is particularly concerning since from the data we see that the number of licenses granted in 2020 is already 64, and we are in the second quarter. Would anyone be wrong if they concluded that these stations were shut down to make way for the award of new licenses? Your guess is as good as mine. Paradox three, more laws, poorer media security. In the media ecosystem, journalists are the center. Their freedom to express themselves is key to the viability of the work we do. The repeal of the criminal libel law in 2001 was great in this regard. Parliament has also passed the right information law. This is great, it's awaiting implementation. Now, while these laws exist on paper, it appears the attacks against journalists is rather going up. The promulgation of these laws do not seem to have guaranteed the freedom and safety for us to do our work. Data from the Media Foundation for West Africa reveals a worrying increase in the number of attacks against media practitioners and media houses. According to their research, there have been 72 incidents of media freedom violations in Ghana between January 2016 and end of October 2020. These include physical assault, arrest, detention, seizure, and damage of equipment, and with the lowest point being the killing of a member of the Anas Arimayao, Anas Tiger Eye team, Ahmed Swale, the murder of Ahmed Swale in 2019. The paradox is that while we appear to be moving towards better quality laws around media freedom, the safety of journalists is on the decline. What makes matters worse is that of the 72 violations, 30 or about 41% of these violations were committed by security agencies. The agents of state paid with our money to protect us are the biggest culprits in attacking journalists. This is not only disappointing, but frankly extremely worrying. This chart shows it. 72 incidents, security agencies 30, individuals 14, political party affiliates 8, organized groups 10, police, soldiers, and people paid with our money are leading in attacking us. This cannot be right. Having pointed out these three paradoxes, let me quickly look at three emerging trends. Now the fact that high-profile media owners have ties with political parties is not new, or it's not surprising to anybody in Ghana. We know some of them. Daily Guide, Net2 TV, Radio Gold, Radio XYZ, Asase and Co. Want to meet TV. Now, this relationship of political ownership appears to have mutated into a troubling trend that has become much more pronounced in recent years. Now, the default format for political programs in the first 20 years of this experiment was to have politicians from different sides debate each other. Crossfire, Joy FM, Kakrai Samoa, Dua Jaho, NDC, MPP. This became, at the time, the standard format for morning shows. So whether it's Good Morning Ghana, Metro TV, Kokro Ko, Peace FM, the format is not perfect, but at least it allows more than one side to be heard. But these days, a new type of radio program is emerged and is dominating the traditional and digital media space. These programs are one-sided and often are hosted by politicians themselves. They are the host of the show, not the guest. <laughs> Boiling point, the seat, won to me or won to me TV, with all due respect, inside politics. These highly partisan programs seem to be doing very well in digital media, sometimes getting live views in the thousands. The fact that some of these programs get regularly flagged by Media Foundation for West Africa's monitoring of indecent, abusive language on radio doesn't seem to deter listeners at all. I think that even makes them more popular. For example, in their September 2020 report, the Media Foundation said 12 out of 20 stations monitored recorded indecent expressions. And I quote, this is Media Foundation's words, not mine. Kumasi Bezuon Timi Radio recorded the highest number of indecent expressions on his morning show. Accra-based Oman FM recorded 19 indecent expressions 
across four programs, Boiling Point, National Agenda, Evening News, Dialogue. Power FM's Inside Politics program also recorded two incidents, end quote. Whether it's the politics that is spawning this type of programming or the programming that's reinforcing the politics is not clear. What is however clear is that the growth in the popularity as evidenced by the increasing hits of these programs on Facebook and YouTube is worrisome for civil public discourse. Another interesting relationship or trend I've observed in the past few years is what I call the financial media fling, the brief relationship between falling finance and mega media. Even though we've shown that media market in Ghana, the commercial market, particularly radio, is highly saturated and characterized by fragmentation of advert revenues and reduced profitability, owners of some financial institutions appear to have a strong and an uncanny appetite for owning them. I present to you figure three. As many as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven financial institutions that collapsed in the past four years had shareholders significantly having stakes in big media houses. Unibank Unicredit, EIB Group, Ideal Finance, TV Africa. And these are, I'm not saying the business owns the media house. It's the same shareholders. So we have to have the correction. So we, we get it right. So there you have it. First Bank, Heritage Bank, Class Media Group, Dream Finance, Live FM, Gold Coast, First Digital, Men's Gold, Zalofon FM, seven. Now, I'm not suggesting that these financial institutions collapse because they own media. That's not what I'm saying. Now, the fact that as many as seven of them either wholly or partially owned important media houses presents a number of questions. One, what do financial company owners see in the media that other business people do not? What kind of analysis do they do before entering the media in terms of buying stake? Three, is the media business meant to reap financial profit or are there other hidden benefits? And of course, to what extent did ownership of these media businesses affect the institutions, all of which are now defunct? The collapse of these institutions will inevitably affect the operations of these media houses. It may not be surprising that post-collapse, and now possibly because of COVID, many have been forced to reduce the level of their activity because the principal source of money is no more. The relationship was short-lived. It was a fling of a romance. But not all the trends are negative. We have good news. There's an emerging trend that bodes well for Ghana's democratic space and serves as a reminder that professional practice, astute management, and visionary ownership can achieve great things. In a yet-to-be-published study, Nikoi and Avle 2020 argue that Stations like CTFM and Joy FM, broadly described as networked radio, could provide a limited but necessary alternative to exacting accountability from public officials as the dynamics of media participation elicit the state's responsiveness more regularly than the formal routes established for these purposes. Networked radio, in their view, describes the integration of social media into radio programming in ways that enrich content and change the nature of the relationship between media, their audience, and duty bearers. The alternative they refer to here is the fact that while a citizen may not get access to their DCE or MCE directly at the local level to respond to their needs, through a network radio entity, citizens may be able to force duty bearers to respond to their needs sometimes directly on air. This, in my view, is one of the most important evolutions of media accountability, of media in Ghana in exacting social accountability. While many electronic radio platforms are ceding their space to the two main political parties to comment 
on and debate most issues along partisan lines, we are seeing that networked radio stations appear to be redefining their gatekeeping role. They are doing so ambidextrously to not only localize national issues, which is the principal job of radio, because radio is local, but they are also nationalizing local issues. They are successfully backing the trend of localizing national issues by using their networks to throw light in what would appear to be local concerns. This approach has worked largely because most of the local problems that listeners lament about are similar across the country. For instance, it's become fairly common for text messages and tweets about a shoddy work by a contractor on the road at Bawe Gonse to lead to a national conversation about the quality of road infrastructure and hold contractors accountable. Another great example of what network radio is doing is the work of Manasseh Azuri Awuni. At his own expense, he investigated CEO of the Public Procurement Authority. His investigations subsequently were aired on both radio and television, contracts for sale. What began as local issues over a contract soon got national escalation to what has now become national procurement breaches. And guess what? Following a Shraj report, the president fired the CEO of the Procurement Authority. This type of work is what credible media can and ought to be doing. But where are the resources? Where is the support? No man goes to war at his own expense. Manasseh is now a freelancer. I wonder where he'll get the resources without the support of joy to keep doing these investigations. This example is both a cause for celebration, but also a clarion call for radio stations in particular to use the power of their network influence to invest in and support daring anti-corruption and accountability work. In summary, the first quarter century of radio in Ghana has been a mixed bag. We've had some great achievements, but there are also failures and excesses and important lessons to learn. I will now turn my attention to three challenges facing us in the next 25 years and recommend how we deal with them. Has the election been declared already? <laughs> Who is leading? The first thing we need to do is to remodel the digital landscape. So three recommendations. We need to remodel the digital landscape. We, and I'll, 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 I'll explain. We need to reimagine the social sphere. That's the second recommendation. And then we need to redefine the relationships. But before we go there, radio has a good fit to stand on. Because of all the sources of news for Ghanaians, and this is over seven years. Look at newspapers' performance. This is Afrobarometer. 5% people depend on newspapers for news. Internet, 19%, but it's growing. Social media, 22%, is growing. Television, 47%, zigzagging, but trending upwards. Radio has to be careful. It's flattening. This is really the summary of what we've said so far. If you stretch this line, internet, social media could overtake radio in the next few years, internet penetration permitting. So what should we do? Given the high cost of internet and the low broadband penetration we have in Ghana, media owners have to find ways of not only integrating new media into their programming, but also have to find ways of being profitable without having to sacrifice their independence. One of the principles of good journalism is that, quote, journalists must be independent of the people they cover, unquote. This is important not just for the individual practitioners like myself, but also the media houses they work for. An important way of achieving this is to have diversified streams of revenue. The more diversified the business source of revenue and advertising, the less control an advertiser will have over them. It's like what they call the single obligor limit in banking. Our independence as journalists is hinged on the independence of our media houses. So it's not just an editorial independence. It must be ideational, financial, and political. So 
I've said this before. Poor pay cannot be a justification for accepting bribes. But media managers must be innovative in coming up with business models that are viable and diversified so they can pay their journalists better. There appears to be a limit to how journalists stay in Ghanaian media. You can watch Wolf Blitzer. He's in his 70s, been hosting this show for years. By the time somebody's 40, wife has two kids, they are thinking of a new job, possibly PRO for some mining company, because we can't pay them well enough. That has to change. If media is going to bring the transformation we need, we need quality, trustworthy voices, some of who are older, to stay in the profession. And I have one year to reach 40, I'm thinking. So our media managers need to re define the business model for diversification. Events, conferencing, in addition to straight advertising. City does some of that. It's a difficult task. But if we don't do that, the business will not survive. If you depend on only one advertiser, if there's a bad story about them, they will give you too much trouble. So sometimes we tell them, please take your money. Let's do our journalism. But you can't always do that. So the new media manager must understand the essence of diversification. So managing media is not a promotion for being a good journalist. We need people who have the business acumen to run diversified media streams. Number two, the social sphere is both an opportunity and a threat. Latest figures from Hootsuite Digital show that about 20% of Ghanaians are on social media. WhatsApp is the number one. Facebook is number two. YouTube is number three. This situation has empowered both the informed and the ignorant to not only react to information, but also generate their own content. It's also created an army of militantly ignorant people who will attack you for saying something against their favorite political party. Poor radio presenters sometimes get trolled for months for saying something that these people didn't find politically correct. In this world where audiences are employed to become content creators, possibilities are limitless, but so are the dangers. This requires a different kind of media practitioner. We have to be ambidextrous, digitally savvy, and conscious of social nuances. There is also the existential threat we face from what Scott Galloway describes as the four horsemen of the media apocalypse. If you read Revelations, you'll find the four horsemen. Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Apple. These four horsemen are dominating the media landscape in a way that few media houses can cope with, much less compete with. Once entrenched, these platforms monopolize the media environment. They provide information embedded within their apps. They serve as gatekeepers for third-party news sources. In doing so, they often dominate the ad market and starve other news sources of revenue, often putting them out of business. Facebook, in particular, is most lethal in this respect. They own the WhatsApp messaging platform, which is the most prevalent social media platform in Ghana, and therefore have the potential to be a major center of control of the hearts and minds of Ghanaians, not just here in Ghana, but worldwide. Their challenge to democracy is not just here in Ghana, but worldwide. And this requires careful thinking, smart policy, and clever business management to balance free speech with responsible public discourse. Finally, after redesigning the business model and reimagining the social sphere, we have to redefine our relationships. The increasingly complex nature of the world and the interrelatedness of phenomena mean that our fundamental appreciation of various relationships and responsibilities has to change. We in the media must change particularly radio, from just giving voice to promoting good values. We must move from focusing on numbers to proper societal impact, from giving visibility to insisting on accountability. We shouldn't just be a platform for discussion and debate. We must also become a catalyst for change at the local level. But this change is not only our responsibility. The political elite also have a role to play. They must stop treating radio and radio licenses as part of their political empires. They must evolve from electoral politics to people-centered policies. 
They must stop thinking about just winning elections to impacting human lives and stop treating citizens as simply voters. But we, the media, have the greater responsibility. The right to free speech must inherently ensure the right to hear. To have free access to all sides of an issue, not just the right to speak. The means, this means the media in general, and radio stations in particular, must move away from partisan coverage, as Madam Chairman said, to a more citizen-centered practice. For radio to be effective in performing its role in the next 25 years, our audience should not just be mere listeners. We must see them as citizens who must be empowered to bring change to their communities. If we do this, citizens will not see themselves as just voters, but they will be active participants and agents for public good. And looking at the crop of fresh minds in the media we have today, I am very optimistic that the next 25 will be better than the first 25. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. God bless you. I look forward to talking in the next quarter century or listening to our kids discuss what the media space that was open for them has now become. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. I think Bernard Avle deserves another round of applause. So much to digest. And at this point, of course, Madam Chair will take over because we're going to be having a question and answer session. If you also have contributions, do feel free. The microphone is the one right behind. It has um, the City FM uh, logo on it. So if you have a question, contribution, please, um, we will take three at a time and then we'll continue from there. But Madam Chairperson uh, will take over. We're just working on getting her a microphone to do so. So if you do have a question, a contribution, please, the first three ladies or gentlemen, we'll definitely be having some ladies here. So we'll be having some questions. Do please go ahead. If you can mention your name, your organization, and then go ahead uh, with your question or comment or contribution. And if we can make it as concise as possible, it would allow for more persons to go ahead as well. Please do start. Bernard, that was a good one. Thank you very much. You suggested that we should move, or we should start thinking towards moving from just sharing information to, as it were, energizing people to take positions on issues in the media. Would you, for instance, want to say that in our journalism schools, rather than just teaching the journalists to be looking at both sides of the story all the time, they should be working more towards advocacy Thank you. Thank you very much. I have two snap, snappy questions. You know, after listening to Manasseh's lecture two weeks ago or so, I became afraid for a uh, journalist. And I remember I, I was listening to, to the radio the next day, hoping that but I do know we'll talk something small about it, but he never mentioned it. I know there is a scripture that says that he that dwell in the secret place of the Most High. As a journalist, you and your colleagues, because Manasi gave us a picture of fear that the times we are in, I mean, using his personal life, all right, it's, it's very, 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 very dangerous. You, you, you put a, a journalist picture on TV three weeks after the journalist is dead. I'm asking this question. Are you safe? 
that, that, that's why I'm saying he, of course, I know you are under the shadow of the Almighty. So you, certainly you are safe, but you're, uh, tell me, are you, are you people okay? <laughs> or, okay, the second question has to do with, uh, like, I wish I, I have a better word to use. I would have called Imam Morrison, uh, uh, not Madam Chair, because she looks like 18, uh, as we know, <laughs> you know, but, but as she quoted, she quoted, he that control the radio, control the mind. Bernard, do you know that you can choose Ghana's next president? You. Do you know? Because you control all of us. In my area, they'll tell me, ah, this guy is always listening to City Heaven. Why is this guy, why don't you go to a different radio station? I say, what, what has that got to do with you? They all, they, they, my people always ask, why is it that this guy is always listening? So Bernard, I'm asking you, you, are, you and your friends, do you people, like you mentioned, two network stations. Do you know that you can literally choose Ghana's next president? Thank you very, very, very much. Thank you. We can take in the questions. Good evening. Uh, my name is Abdel Fattah Tahira Kiyeli. I'm a consultant uh, on land administration. I've been uh, a researcher for about 15 years working as a data processing manager. Uh, my concern has to do with the capacity of journalists in not feeling intimidated when they are interviewing politicians. Uh, as an avid listener on uh, political talk shows, there are times that I've felt very frustrated at the way some journalists feel intimidated because some of the politicians, especially the young ones, have adopted this posture of intimidating the politician, uh, the, sorry, the journalists. So I really want to appeal to media houses to see how they can build and empower the, the journalists when they are interviewing the politicians in particular. As a, as, work, as a professional working as a researcher, many of the times when we come up with these uh, opinion polls, you realize that particularly when you have been in the field interviewing people at the grassroots, you realize that their main source of information is just the radio or TV, what they listen to. And they don't have any means of cross-checking what people are saying on radio and TV. So when a politician is speaking, or a resource person is speaking, and the one who is interrogating the one who is speaking feels so intimidated and will just be saying that, let me allow him to speak. If somebody is saying something and you, the journalist, know that what he's saying is not factual, you have a responsibility, and I like that point that Bernard Avle made about empowering the journalists. Because if the fellow goes away with what he's saying, which is not factual, that is what somebody at the grassroots is going, is going to be informed about. And when the researchers go out there, like uh, Afrobarometer and the rest go out there to interview them, that's what they will turn out. So many a times, all these reports about Afrobarometer are just wrong information that people are just receiving. So I really want to see the media houses and the journalists doing a lot of work on that. Thank that you point. for that Thank contribution. You. Also, your questions. Um, Bernard, um, can you go ahead and start answering the questions? I will also take some more contributions and questions, so get your minds you know, ready and your questions ready, your suggestions, your contributions, and we'll come to you. Thank you. Uh, Chris, you're asking whether in training journalists we focus just on providing two sides of an issue instead of letting them know the power they have to solve problems. So we have three roles. We are gatekeepers, we are watchdogs, we are scorekeepers. I think that the reason sometimes journalists focus on just problems and letting people talk is that they do not, they, they, they do not 
we, we, don't, we, 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 live, we let them live shielded lives. For example, a journalist in a community with bad roads or a journalist who takes structure every day can never lack a story to do from various angles. So one way of training journalists is not just the theory of the three things I've said, gatekeeper, watchdog, or scorekeeper, but also essentially leaving them within the community. A friend of mine calls it solutions journalism. And I think as citizens get frustrated with our democracy, you will notice a lot of that. For example, the advocacy in Adenta that led to the footbridges. A lot of the guys who started that advocacy were journalists who live in Adenta. They formed the WhatsApp groups, they mobilized the people. Some of them never spoke to the media, but they are the guys who mobilize the people because they know who the road minister is, they have access to the highways people. So that will increasingly happen as people get better informed. So I see a lot of that happening. Somebody asked me that I feel safe. Well, I think that for me, the problem is not about me or somebody feeling safe. What tends to happen, which is disappointing, is that when people are attacked, we don't push the issue to its logical conclusion. And there's a particular case in point. The journalist was assaulted by somebody. The, new, the, the editors went to court in Kumasi to pursue the matter. After speaking to the journalist, when they got to court, the, the, the journalist said he's not interested in pursuing the matter anymore. Some people believe that there was some out of court settlement. And the editor took a plane to Kumasi only to be disappointed that his journalist wasn't interested in pursuing the matter. It's a bit like these rape stories and defilement. So there's a certain culture in which people feel that if you seek legal redress or you pursue an issue to the end, oh, Chimansu too much. And therefore, they said, let's leave it to God. I think media houses can support their journalists by pursuing those cases. That is what will empower us. Because every job is dangerous. But if the assault doesn't get resolved, that's what breeds impunity. So my view is that we must see these things through. Now, your second one was just a contribution, so I'll take it like that. So I, I think that was, there was no comment on that. It was a contribution. Thank you. Mm. Um, there was another question. OK, you've answered that already. Um, are you safe? I might, which is why I try to answer. Mm. It, I say it's not about me being safe or not being safe. The real issue is that if something, if somebody attacks a journalist or me, what do we do next? Exactly. So that's what will make you safe, because every job is dangerous. Every job is dangerous. Is that so? Is teaching dangerous? Yes, it can be. OK, so we'll take the next set of questions and contributions as well. The microphone is right there. OK, please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> my name is uh, Jack Jim Dawson. An empty and heroes of change, 2017. Uh, Mr. Avery, your message was very exciting. I, I, what, the statistics that you gave give me a lot of uh, uh, issues to think about. When I was born and when I was growing, there were very, very few radio stations. And you could just open and listen and go on with your life. But today, if your son or your daughter buys a wireless just to tune for a message, that child is bound to be confused. Because there are a lot of stations that that person will be, will, will be tuning. Even when you open a station, you never finish what the message is given. Then all of a sudden, you have to move on to another one because some of them have caught in the space. But my my, my Question, my uh, question to uh, the speaker is that you said if we are not careful, we get to 1,000 radio stations. What can we do to reduce, to stop that? Because I know in the US, some of the radio, they are having plans now to stop some of these radio stations. Some of the stations are in people's kitchen, people's wardrobe, people's veranda. And the, the system is so powerful that as soon as they start speaking, people start hearing. I was listening to a Voice of America, and they said the Hispanic. They have their own radio station, and they are always having programs, and it, they, this infiltrates into other uh, programs activities. And they went and caught some group far on top of a building, broadcasting uh, uh, their, their messages. So please, I am old but young. Let us cut this thing down to the barest minimum. Thank you. Okay. Yes, uh, next question. Thank you. So, quick question. Um, 
what do you prescribe as a way to rescue the media from the monocracy of politics? Politics has infiltrated the media where for a small country that's still very young democratically, we seem to have a lot of division where the media in certain circles has a lot of influence and peddles that influence to the whims and caprices of politicians. How do we fix that? Okay, we can take another question. Um, good evening, my name is Suleiman Abraima. Bernard, thank you very much for a very enlightening um, presentation uh, on very, very critical issues. Now, <clears throat> Today is Thursday, and throughout this week, I've barely had the chance to be able to sit before my computer or you know, sit with my colleagues to discuss what's happening. Um, what has been engaging me have been two issues, and it's been about conversations with journalists, either on the phone, um, via Zoom, or in person. And the first one is the question of censorship. And that, for example, tells me how well intended some journalists in the country um, are. And these are journalists who are talking about great stories that they are doing, that their managers or editors are frustrating them. So, no, this story, this season is not too good for a story like this. No, if we do this, the opposition will say we are coming after them, or the government will say, we are coming after them. I would want you to share your experiences around that. The second point um, has been the question of safety, and I think that has been spoken about by a number of people, and including yourself. Um, I've had journalists talk to me about the same thing about doing critical stories, and it's either somebody is calling them from the police or from the BNI or from other security agencies telling them, look, please halt you know, this story because it's a matter under investigation. Of course, as somebody who manages a media organization, what would be your response to your journalist coming to you to say, I'm investigating this story. I've had a call from this CID officer or from a BNI officer telling me the story is under investigation and therefore I should stop it. And in fact, it goes on to say, you know, that look, I am warning you for the second time or for the third time um, about stopping this story, otherwise you could be in trouble. And these have been the issues that, and people come to me you know, discussing the issue of not feeling safe, particularly um, towards the election and all of that. So the question of safety is so critical, and if you can um, touch on that. The other is, I think earlier a colleague talked about it, the partisanship. And I don't know your attitude. If tomorrow, for one reason or the other, the MPP or the NDC say they are boycotting your platform, what would be your attitude? Because we've seen um, similar instances where, in the end, the media organization apologizes to the political party to say, oh, we want you back. You know, um, we want the friendship to continue, and so on and so forth. Must journalism really be about, about that? Um, the other thing is the ownership and 1,000 radio stations. We have an entity that is supposed to be managing our radio frequencies that has refused to be transparent. So who is getting the frequencies? If you ask them sometimes, they themselves perhaps, either they don't know or they refuse to give to you. And we know that the number that you talked about in terms of how many frequencies have been issued this year, literally 90 to 100, I mean 90 or 99 percent of those frequencies have been issued to political people. And from the monitoring we are doing, people don't care what they are using their radio stations for. People will tell you, look, forget about ethics. We are using you know, this thing to make sure that we win power or we stay uh, in power. And that certainly is a, a very, very um, critical thing. And then, of course, you touched on the economics of the media and the media viability. When you talk to journalists across, particularly outside of Accra, you are likely to come across 90 or more percent of journalists telling you, over the last three months, we have not been paid. How do we sustain the business of journalism, push for professionalism, 
when those who are working you know, in the industry are not being paid. So these are the issues that I would want your take on them. I hope you are not accepting me to answer all these questions. <laughs> so I'm sure you are just pointing them out so less people know they exist. First question was asked about somebody who says, why, what can we do to stop the radio stations from expanding? Well, by pointing out what we've just done, okay, so if, I mean, there's nothing else I can do. I, I can't tell NCA to stop giving licenses, so we point it out, and then you vote with your ears. So you, you don't listen to any radio station because it exists. You choose stations that are high quality. By, that, by so doing, you weed out the ones that are not good. In Shira, the issue of money and politics. You know, I don't treat problems in silos. Corruption in the society is not just a media problem. So it affects everything, which is why I spoke about independence and diversified streams. So you need a viable business to be strong. Okay, I don't think somebody can tell Bloomberg News, don't do this story or that story, because there's a product and a business that works, and there's a media house that depends on that. So the viability of the business is a, an important part of the independence, which is why I said independence is not just a question of editorial, but it's also financial, because if 90% of your adverts come from one company, you are dead if they threaten you with a story and they say, we'll pull our adverts. So that's why we focus on diversifying media streams. You are talking about censorship. I am a manager in, at City, so if any of my reporters has come to tell you that they've stopped the story, that means I'm the one who did it, because I'm in charge of news. <laughs> so what I, the way we, we, we work on that is, I, I tell young journalists, sometimes trying to go alone is not good. We, we need to do media networks, okay, where you work as a team, because if you're the only one working on a story, and your manager tells you don't put the story out, if there's three or four of you working in multiple media houses, there are other platforms the story can go. In fact, some of the best stories that journalists have done globally have been done by networks of media people, the Panama Papers and things. So yes, we are competitors, but there are times where I have had people call me from other radio stations and giving me stories to do because they say, your platform is better for this story. So I think journalists can solve for that managerial editorial interference by learning to conspire in a positive sense. Evil people are always conspiring. Good people are always working alone. It's not a good thing. So don't be tribal. I'm joy, I'm city, I'm choice. That, it doesn't work like that. You need to see yourself as being on the same side. So I say to young journalists, that's how you do it. Media networking. That's the way to go about it. Uh, partisanship in uh, what? A word of license in Suleiman. These things you know already. I was just reiterating things you already know. Financial independence, diversification, I've already spoken about it. So a lot of the things you said, I don't have answers for. You are essentially pointing out serious challenges in the work we do. So I, was, I can't say I have an answer. If I had an answer, I wouldn't be sitting here. All right? So you, you've raised the salient questions that confront us as journalists and managers of media businesses, which we all have to address. I always say that you must develop the media before the media can bring development. All right, so it's media development before media for development. A media house that does not have resources cannot bring in a development. So we need to focus on the aspect that builds the media's resilience. Then the media can do its job. A lot of times we just criticize journalists by saying, oh, you guys are not doing the right thing. You've already pointed out, somebody's not been paid for three months. How is it going to be accountable? You go and collect an envelope and do anything you ask him to. So the question of management in media is a crucial question. Do you, do you follow my, my point? And it, your organization and co should also focus on that. There's a lot of talking about journalists are not professional, journalists don't know this, American journalists are better and all of that. The organization behind the person is viable. That's why I've stayed here for 19 years. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't properly paid. I have a wife and kids. And it's not because of the money I'm doing it, but I also cannot go to work at my own expense. So we need to think about the viable. That is why this one ton award of licenses is destructive. Because you're basically making it, I've had people call me that, oh, I have a radio license, can you tell me what to do? I'm like, are you serious? You've bought radio in your village and you have no clue what to do with it and you're asking me to help you to do it. How did you get a license? Well, but we get a lot of that. So, I don't know. And I, I'm a radio station. I can't now spend my life fighting against awarding other licenses. That's not my work. Okay, so we need society. Nothing changes in Ghana until there's sufficient public opinion against it which is what I've learned. So if the public is happy with it, it will stay the same way it is. So the only thing I think our politicians fear is shame. 
So we have to, when we do shows, come to us and speak. Don't be hiding. Because we, we cannot be talking every day. You talk about safety. A lot of people will call you and say, I want to say something, but don't mention my name. I want to give you a story, but I don't want you to. Why? Okay, why, why do you want to hide? You say you have a story. You don't want your name mentioned. You don't want it to be traced to you. Well, <laughs> safety is for all of us. So if, if I'm, I don't have a, I, look, if, if we don't fight the system, you will never be safe. Okay, so if you, no, no <laughs> look, let me not get into it. The point I'm making is that we all have a part to play in this job. And it, don't stop seeing journalists as the ones who are solving that problem. You need to support us. And you need to volunteer information. Otherwise, we can't do anything. You, do you understand my point? So it's a collective responsibility. Otherwise, nothing will change in this country. So I don't know if I've answered your question. If I'm not, I'm sorry. <laughs> Any more contributions, questions? Yes, to the microphone. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, my name is Inus Mohamed. Um, I'm a Nima boy. Uh, yeah, so um, one of the things I've also um, observed is, uh, Mr. Bernard, um, don't you see that there is an emerging trend of journalists fighting against journalists in the pursuit of national interest or media houses fighting against me? I'll cite two uh, examples. Some time ago, Anatete declined to speak to Joy FM. She declined to speak to Joy FM about um, xenophobic attacks on Ghanaians in South Africa. And I remember she specifically told the Joy FM report, I will not speak to you. I will speak to Radio Gold and CTFM. If you, if, you don't, if you like, go and listen to them and get the, uh, what's the name, the feedback. And truly, CTFM and Radio Gold and, and Graphic granted that request um, by sidelining the Joy FM. Don't you think um, that at media houses, you are working uh, antithetical towards um, each other? The second one also is... Um, who ensures the, 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 the profundity or depth of reading in um, journalists of the country? I listened to your program. One of the things I like about your program is the books you discuss. There was a time you discussed uh, my vision. Um, uh, Mohammed Maktoum al-Rashid. You discussed the leader who had no title by Robin Sharma. You discussed autobiography of Kwame Nkrumah, which you think every Ghanaian should read or every journalist should read. Excuse me to say you meet a journalist we so hollow, so shallow, so vacuous, excuse me to say, uh, but the person carries himself as journalist. And our chairman, chairperson just told us that he who controls the, uh, what's the name, information controls the mind and sets the agenda for the country. So please, who ensures the death amongst journalists in the country? Thank you very much. My name is Enoch Jidu Esando, a student from the University of Ghana. And my question is, in your presentation, you did mention that poor pay should not be a catalyst for bribery and corruption. So as a media personnel, as a journalist, how, how should you survive? How will you survive? That's my question. <laughs> nice question. One more before Bennett starts. OK, you can respond. Thank you. Um, Hannah Tete's situation. We always have a call to make between the public's right to hear a public official and creating the impression that we are working at cross purposes. Now, if the interview we did with Radio Gold did not ask her the important questions the public needed to know, then we failed. Because in the environment in which we are in, there are always politicians who pick personal feuds and have their personal favorites. That's why media pluralism is important. So if they run away from joy, they come to city, we still check them. But if we say we'll all do a boycott, not knowing the reason or the nuances behind the boycott, then we are also not doing you a good, we are not, we are not helping you because public officials must speak. So the fact that they say don't talk to one person doesn't mean, and they didn't tell us what questions to ask or questions not to ask. So if the interview we did was poor quality, then we have a problem. But if it was a good quality interview, we move on. Okay, we, we don't have time for petty feuds because there are bigger problems at stake. Reading. It's not just journalists who don't read. A lot of people don't read in this country. Of course, it's more dangerous for journalists not to read. So the recruitment is important. We take them, in our case, from university. They are eager to learn. They don't have to have steady journalism. We pick them from various fields. They have to have an appetite for knowledge, right? That's what we try and do. We are not perfect at it, but that's where journalism is going. 
So with, without information, in fact, some of the topics I discuss, most of my listeners even know it better than I do. This is what I tell our team. So reading is absolutely crucial. These days you can read by listening in audio forms. So that one, I don't think I should talk too much about it. How do you survive if you are not paid? I'll say to you that there are two things. I tell young journalists, work to learn before you work to earn. There's always a period where you will not have money. We used to work for, for distances. Now, if you build your craft, if you build your craft, you gain credibility. What credibility does is it opens doors. We call it galamse, MC in here. Summarize the book there to subsidize the salary. Do you follow me? That's not an excuse for the people not to pay you well, but if you build your craft and your credibility, you will never lack opportunity. So if you're a young journalist, if you take the money, you'll never get the respect. Anybody who gives you money thinks he controls you. Nobody can sit in front of me thinking that he can influence what I ask him because I won't take money from you. Do you understand me? And you need to learn that early when you are young. Otherwise, by the time you become big and they start calling you a celebrity, the platform will destroy you. So it's important to intern, work on a campus radio station where there's no money, walk to cover stories, take trot trot. That's how you learn to develop honesty, not when you become a big guy on Super Morning Show. It will be too late. Please, do follow me? If you build your craft, your credibility will open doors for you. So that's my personal advice to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard. Any more questions, contributions? Okay. Okay, last one. My name is Enoch Enyane. Uh, my question is, um, in your presentation, you did mention that um, for radio to be effective, the audience should not just be seen as mere listeners, but citizens who are ready to um, impact on the developmental agenda. Um, here lies the case, you give the platform um, to these citizens to contribute to developmental agenda, um, you know, you are discussing on the radio. And they end up um, using abusive words on the, um, you know, the political um, personalities in question. So should we continue to give them the opportunity to use those abusive words or we should censor them? Thank you. I think that's the last question. Thank you. Thank you. Not the, the, not the, you are very responsible as a journalist to sift and a presenter as a gatekeeper. So the fact that somebody will be misguided, for example, even in asking questions, some people will come and ask questions that are offside. That doesn't mean we shouldn't let people ask questions. So that's why you have judgment in managing the platform. That's why you also need diversify. So if people are calling and they are becoming serial callers, let, I'll, I'll tell you something, for example, on our show, when we open the phone lines, only usually men call because a lot of women don't like calling to radio shows. So how do we solve for that? Well, we ask them to do WhatsApp audio message. You don't need to call 0302 10 times and then some serial caller will go ahead of you. Just pick your phone, record yourself by WhatsApp audio message and send it to us. When we did that, we got more female listeners and then you can sift the quality of the audio before you put it on. So there are ways in which you can work around getting the right quality, but by all means, we have to give the citizens a platform to air their views and also to interact directly with their leaders. That's what I mean by making our listeners not just audiences, but citizens. So there's a way to work around that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Call in, but asking that they send voice notes. We haven't had a woman ask a question or make a contribution this evening as well. So can we do that? Can we change that? <laughs> no, we can't send voice notes. <laughs> yes, please give her a round of applause as she makes her way to, to the microphone. <laughs> I'm just here for the women. My name is Adelaide Bennett Prempe, I'm a lawyer. I don't particularly have a question, Bennett, um, but I'm a great admirer of your show. I'm a great admirer of what you do. We both have similar backgrounds in the sense that we're both University of Ghana. 
Um, I often do wonder when I turn my radio on in the mornings um, that if I had the opportunity, I'll ask you what motivates you because you are at it every morning like clockwork. The same energy, the same passion, um, and you're relatively young. So clearly, I know your parents must have done something right by you, but I also want to know what motivates you, if it's something that you can say for the younger generation, because I definitely get the sense that the younger generation are struggling. Um, so a few words, Bernard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Edward. Uh, Bernard, I want to ask you, um, on the issue of the collapse of the banks, I, I am surprised that um, as we speak now, in fact, it took a religious person to actually come out to say that we cannot admit that all the nine or so banks that were faced out did something wrong. Um, all that you hear are uh, justifications from the political party, but you don't get anything from the front of the, of the media giving us facts as to whether we can really authenticate that all the nine banks really ought to have been, you know, collapsed. Would you say that it's one of the areas that probably uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe say that the media is not doing that well? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first question, madam, thank you for listening. We appreciate it. What motivates me? <sighs> There's a quote I heard when I was very young. It says, regret for things done can be tempered with time, but regret for things not done are inconsolable. Regret for things done can be tempered with time. So if you make a mistake, you hit your foot against a stone, next time you walk carefully. But if a, if, if a door opens and you don't en enter, you just kick yourself forever. So what motivates me is the fear that I'll become an old man who regrets I didn't use radio to do my best. And I'll be calling a young radio presenter and disturbing him every day. That, oh, go do this, do that, do this, do that. So, so sometimes I say to myself, let me empty myself now because I don't know what the next 10 years will bring. So I don't want to regret and say, now, now thinking this is what radio should be used for. That, that's why I, I, I want to do my best now. And as you said, my parents were brilliant. They, they trained me the right way. And of course, their friends and all that. Me, um, the issue of the, the collapsed banks. So, you know, this is interesting because we spent a lot of airtime discussing this. Okay, now, what did we discuss? We discussed the reports that were filed. You use the bank statements. These are tricky issues because they are issues in court as well, right? So are you going to take the view of the people who did the report, produce a bulldozer report and said, these guys are using shareholders' funds? Or you're going to listen to the... It's very tricky, all right? So what we do is present the information we know, we explain it. So I remember taking time, weeks, to explain the builders' report, ask the Bank of Ghana whether they are punishing their own people for dereliction of duty, the 27 million that they claim somebody used to bribe people. What have they done about that? We've asked those questions. Sometimes because of the noise and all the admixture, people don't hear all of that. Okay? Now, because some of the matters are criminal in nature and in court, and because the focus is now on people wanting their monies paid, the story evolves. You follow me? So now, if you miss the window of discussing what went wrong, now it's more about how do we solve the problem of those whose monies have been locked up. So the story has moved on like three levels now. So we can't go back there. So we can definitely do better. And if we train people who understand financial statements, economic journalism is a major deficiency in this country. And that's probably the subject of another lecture by somebody else. Because the relationship between finance, politics, and business is a very big one. So I admit we don't have all the understanding, the nuances, and the appetite to break it down for people to understand. But I think we spend a bit of time on it, okay? And as for whether the banks did everything wrong or not, we neither really, really neither here nor there. At the end of the day, we are where we are. So I can't start making judgment calls on the basis of the limited information I have. That would be too dangerous, okay? So I, I think I admit that we could have done better, but that, that's my explanation for why we did what we did. Thank you very much. Okay. I think that we all deserve a round of applause for asking very, very 
good questions and making good contributions. And Mr. Avle also deserves a round of applause for answering all our questions. We can now have closing remarks from Madam Chair. It's been a exciting evening. I expected it to be because um, Bernard is always on point. He always has a lot to say. Um, I picked several things from it, especially in terms of the viability of the media, the need to diversify to ensure that revenue is shored up and then journalists are paid well because every day we have um, those issues concerning journalists and their work and you know how, how journalists can easily be influenced. Also, um, one thing I also want to touch on and borrow a phrase is citizens and not spectators. Um, how do we encourage citizens not to be spectators, but to help push the agenda forward for democracy, good governance and development? That is also key. Uh, one issue that Bernard also raised that is important is not just radio, but the, how should I say it, the support of social media and ensuring that people are heard and people, people's voices are heard wide widely and also to help actually effect the change that needs to be done. These are key things. I mean, over the years, we've seen how media has evolved right from just the traditional media to social media and how do we actually control the narrative there is very important. Um, thank you so much. There's been a lot of um, things to chew on. Um, I'm sure that um, going away, you're going to think about this and obviously, um, this lecture is also available, I'm sure, on social media and Facebook and everything. You can go back to it, pick on issues, have discussions amongst yourselves, because that's what we do. We like to tell the stories, but we need to tell the real stories, the impactful stories, and also effect the change that needs to be effected. We also need to be wary of um, how ownership can control content in such a way as to sort of like block out the actual information that needs to get to citizens. So we have to be aware of ownership as well, and it's also very key. Thank you very much, Bernard, for such an insightful lecture. Um, I learn something every day, and I have learned a lot from Bernard today as well, and I hope you have too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And the conversation also continues on social media. Hashtag Avla Speaks, hashtag Cronti2020, hashtag Contini Akwamu. So do continue to tweet and make your comments and contributions. But that's how we end the 16th edition of the lecture. We'll catch you next year, maybe earlier in the year, if COVID-19 allows for that to happen. Don't go anywhere yet. We have refreshments uh, just at the back, so you can um, have something to eat, have something to drink as we continue the conversation. Thanks very much once again.